thank you everybody for attending today. It's a pleasure to be here and to uh, to interact with all of you. Um, my name is, so this is our, our third, so this, I don't understand this little camera bird creature that's going to track me the whole time, but it's doing a good job. Um, so, so my name is Patrick Bora. I'm, oh, wow, it really does. Intriguing. Um, uh, my name is Patrick Bora, and I'm the director of the Quantum Science and Engineering Center here at George Mason University. I'm an, also an associate professor of physics in the physics and astronomy department, and it's my pleasure to, to be here with you all on our third annual Quantum Week. And tomorrow is World Quantum Day, and things typically get days because they're important and interesting. Um, and so I hope to be able to convey to you both why this area is important and interesting and why it should excite you. And for those of you who are young in the audience and not yet converts to the cause of quantum, um, you know, I, I hope I'll be able to share with you why it might be an important thing to make a part of your future plans for, for where you want to go in your life. Okay? So first of all, uh, at the core of our efforts here at George Mason University is our Quantum Science and Engineering Center. Um, we've existed since 2018. And as you can see from our, um, well, and you virtual friends can't see a, a darn thing. Does this thing let me have? Aha, look at that, a little laser pointer for you. As you can see, technical difficulties. Uh, as you can see here, you know, our departments, the, the departments here at George Mason that participate in our center are rather broad. We have members from chemistry and biochemistry, from math and physics and astronomy, comp sci, electrical and computer engineering, mechanical engineering, and education. And so this should kind of convey to you the scope of, of what, you know, when you hear people talk about quantum in the future, conveying the scope of what it is. That's two lasers, one laser for you, one laser for you. All right, somebody's gonna get hit in the face. All right, anyway, moving on and we are recording. And so let's go. So um, what I want to start with is to talk to you a little bit about what quantum is, right? And so, you know, in popular media, you've very often seen presentations of what atoms look like. And in many cases, it looks like this. And so what I'm gonna tell for you over the next few slides are things about quantum that, that deviate from your typical view of what the world is and how it works, right? And so what I wanna start about first here is dealing with something that's very quantum, which is a single atom, right? So this is kind of showing you kind of a planetary Bohr style model of what an atom looks like, where you have a nucleus with your protons and electrons, and then around it orbiting, you have, uh, not protons and electrons, goodness gracious me, we're off to a great start, protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and orbiting it with these black particles here are the electrons. And in this illustration, it looks like, you know, it looks Keplerian, right? It looks like we have planets going around the sun. And that's not actually what's happening. In this view, it seems that an electron is a particle with a well-defined position and momentum. It's undergoing an orbit. In reality, it's very much not. Particles that are quantum mechanical have characteristics that are inherently probabilistic in nature. So we can't say where the electron is at a given moment in time and how fast it's going. We can only describe um, the probability of where it is using something called the wave function. And so for different uh, energy states that an electron may be in, it exists in different spatial probability distributions where you can have these electrons localized in these different kinds of patterns. So these heat maps are showing you around an atom for different energy levels where the electron is most likely to be. Ooh, we got flickering lights too. So that light is illustrating probabilistic. It's either on or, you know, we don't know. It'll be on or off, okay? So, all right. So this is the first big point I wanna make. When we look at the universe at its most fundamental levels, we find it is probabilistic in nature, which is very different from your daily experience, okay? Now, not just is the universe probabilistic, uh, it gets weirder than that. Now, I've mentioned to you different energy states for electrons here, right? Particles cannot be in an arbitrary, state of energy. They can only occupy certain discrete states of energy. That's going to drive me nuts. Um, so only certain discrete energy states, right? But what's really 
interesting is that these particles can be prepared in something called the superposition state, which is a combination of two states. And it can exist in those two states simultaneously. The most often illustration of this is, is this thought experiment where you are very mean to cats and I prefer dogs, so I love this experiment. Now, so you take this cat and you put it in a box and you connect the Geiger counter to uh, a switch that's connected to a hammer and then there's a vial of poison. Why not, I guess. Uh, so in this experiment, based upon the rate of random decay, radioactive decay of, of some radioactive elements in this box here, right? It triggers, you know, this, this, this counter to create a click, which triggers the switch to flip, which triggers the poison vial to break, which may or may not kill the cat, right? And then you put all this in a box because, you know, you may want to just be in a box if you're a cat and this is happening to you. Why not? Right? So you, as an external observer, have absolutely no idea at any given point whether the cat is still alive or it's dead. The box is also soundproof, so you can't hear the mewing or the clawing on the sides as it attempts to escape. Right? So you have no idea. And so the cat can be described as existing in a simultaneous superposition of a state of both being dead and both being alive. It's a little morbid, but it gets across the point. Quantum mechanical particles can be prepared in a simultaneous superposition of two states. And what's crucial is you won't actually be able to know what state it's in until you do a measurement, until you open the box and check to see if you still have a cat. Okay. So that's another weird thing. That's like, you know, being able to be saying you're here and not here, right? That, um, that an arrow points up and down at the same time. Superposition is very strange. What is stranger still is, is probing into the heart of matter itself a little bit more and so let's talk about light for a second. Many of you may be aware, light can be described as a wave, right? Different colors correspond to different electromagnetic magnetic waves and different kinds of wavelengths, right? And you can do experiments that, that show this. If you take a, uh, a wall and you cut two slits in it and you illuminate it with a light source, what you'll observe is an interference pattern on a wall far away from those two slits. This is because you're sending light waves through those two slits and they end up interfering either constructively or destructively on a wall far away from the slits. So that's called an interference pattern and it's something you've also seen if you've ever taken two rocks and dropped them in a pond at the same time. You create two sources of waves. Those waves overlap in some places and cancel out in others. This is an indication that light itself is a wave. But there's this nifty experiment called the photoelectric effect where what you find is that light exhibits characteristics more consistent with a particle. And I won't dig into the details of this, I don't have the time for it right now, but essentially what matters in this thing called the photoelectric effect, when you're trying to use light to eject electrons from the material is not how much light you're sending at it, it's what the color is, it's what the wavelength is. So I could send a trillion, zillion, million, jillion photons at something, that are at a lower energy, i.e. a longer wavelength, and I wouldn't eject any electron. But I send one with the appropriate energy, or I send a very small number of ones with, with the appropriate energy, and suddenly I'm ejecting these, these electrons willy-nilly. That seems to suggest that light has a particle characteristic. It's not like you're turning up the amplitude of the wave. It's instead like you're shooting little bullets at this thing. And only bullets going at the right speed will kick something else out. So we have these two viewpoints on what light is. And what it comes out to be is that light is both. It is a wave and a particle. This is a cute little, uh, little uh, 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 cartoony thing done by Douglas Hofstede, uh, where he's showing, you know, you can write wave particle, which is it? It's both, right? So. We call this wave particle duality, right? So we have three things now. The reality is probabilistic and fuzzy in nature. Things can be in different states at the same time. They can be in superpositions. And when you look at individual particles, which you're used to thinking about as billiard balls, you find they are not. They are billiard ball-ish, but also wave-ish in nature. So it gets weirder. And it gets even weirder still because we just talked about light. I didn't tell you about matter. Matter 
shows the same effects. So this experiment done in 2013 actually showed that you can create this kind of an interference effect between individual molecules that contain 810 atoms. So you can show this kind of double slit-esque quantum interference effect with big chunks of matter, which suggests that the matter itself contains wave-like characteristics. If it didn't, you wouldn't observe interference patterns. So that is really strange. So it's not just the light thing. Everything, all chunks of matter, protons, neutrons, electrons, everything else you build up with, right? All of it, wave particle duality. So we have a lot of weird stuff now. Probabilistic, probabilistic nature reality, superposition states, wave particle duality. And why not make it worse? There is something called quantum entanglement, which is a very, very strange thing. Some of you may have seen the Marvels trailer that came out the other night, Kamala Khan, um, the other characters whose names I don't know, uh, but no, it's all. Thanks, Joe. You're the man. All right, throw me a bone. So they have a thing going on where their powers are entangled. So they use their powers and they swap positions. It's not quantum entanglement, but it kind of is showing you something similar in idea. The, the idea of this is that if you have two particles that, um, if you have two particles that are quantum in nature, and they interact with each other. Remember, we talked about probability distributions, right? When they interact with each other, their probability distributions, their probability of what state they're in become connected, okay? So they interact with each other, and then I can separate them, and I can take one to the edge of the universe in my life, and I can take the other, you know, to Kmart. Wait, we don't have this. It's 7-Eleven, right? So I could take them to very different places, very different environments, right? And their probabilities will still remain connected. And what this will mean is that the state of this particle will be dependent upon the state of this particle and vice versa. And so if you do a measurement on one, you automatically know the state of the other, right? So this is weird. It doesn't matter how far apart you take these things, they still remain connected, right? Even over billions of light years, potentially, right? So if any of this doesn't seem weird to you, then I really want to know what your experience is like growing up, because it's quite strange to me, right? So these are all very non-intuitive, atypical things humans don't encounter as they, as they grow up, okay? They have no classical equivalents. And what's important right now at this moment in time is that they're providing us as a species with access to new capabilities technologically. And that's where things get very exciting right now. Okay, so let's talk about what the investments are in this area. I'm gonna follow it up with a little bit of discussion of some possible technologies that hopefully will excite you a bit. Um, the idea of making technologies that use quantum effects as their fundamental operating principles has generated a lot of excitement and a lot of investment. Here in the US very recently in 2018, we passed something called the National Quantum Initiative, which put a couple billion dollars towards supporting standing up efforts in quantum across academia, government, and industry, and doing so in a coordinated manner. So they call this doing an all of nation approach, right? So there are many, um, you know, federal agencies that take part in this. All the logos are there. I'm not going to read them, right? But what's also important is that there is massive, massive corporate interest in this. At the time that I made these slides, I got tired of counting the number of companies on the QEDC website, the Quantum Economic Development Consortium website. And there are great, more than 130 companies um, that are a member of this consortium that partner together to try to push quantum forward as a technology and as a future economy for the nation, okay? It's more than that, but it was late and I was tired. All right, so what are they trying to do? We're trying to achieve a new technological revolution that is built upon making technology of quantum effect. And so we already had a first um, quantum technological revolution. Well, a first quantum revolution in terms of fundamental science, where we discovered the laws of the universe based on quantum physics. Right? Then we began building our first round of quantum technology. And this is not so much a technology that uses a fundamental quantum effect to achieve some sort of functionality. It's instead Developing the control over matter to such a degree that you can start to create technologies using it. So what this means is our ability to grow silicon in large wafer scales and controllably dope silicon 
in such a manner that we can make electronic devices that shuttle charge around on a chip that we can use for computing or we can use for sensing or photo detection and so on. Okay? And it also led to other interesting and groundbreaking technologies such as the laser being able to create you know, sources of monochromatic light. What we're talking about doing right now though is fundamentally different. Here, we're talking about fault effects where you're manipulating many different quantum degrees of freedom in a material at once and not necessarily intentionally. Here, in, second, in the second quantum revolution that we're going right now, the technologies are based upon manipulating individual quantum states or collections of quantum states intentionally and intelligently. We use these strange properties such as superposition and entanglement as the basis of the operation of our technology. And there are many different applications of it, which I'll get into in a moment. When is my time up? 1040? Okay, so let's move forward this a little bit more. Um, so quantum computing is one area where you can have the use of, quantum, uh, uh, of circuit elements that are, are quantum mechanical in nature, and it can offer you a big advantage. The typical computing bit is based on a transistor, which is either conductive or not, depending upon the voltage you apply to it, right? And that transistor forms the basis of binary logic, where non-conductive is zero, conductive is one. And so you flip those individual transistors and then you get, you know, your Xbox, right? Quantum computers are different. The individual bits here can exist in superposition states. They can be zero and one simultaneously. Moreover, they can also be entangled with each other so that the state of one qubit is tied irreversibly to this, well, not irreversibly, is tied to the state of another qubit and another and another and another. And so the idea with quantum computers is that you build a chip with many qubits, all of which are entangled together, where you manipulate their collective quantum state. And that is a new way to process information. And it's a way of processing information that can make problems that are impossible on current computers solvable very quickly. And so there are many different companies taking many different approaches to solving the problem of making a quantum computer that is you know, actually um, able to deliver on the power, on the promise of this power, such as IBM and IonQ. Um, but if, planned, if successful, this will really be transformative for us in a variety of different areas. Now, another place where quantum can be useful uh, is in communication and encryption and security. NSA is one of the big funders of quantum computing. Why is that? Well, the reason why is quantum computers are awesome at prime number factorization, which means you get to say goodbye to RSA encryption. So it's no longer so easy to do the one-click buy on Amazon. That's not such a secure purchase all of a sudden. All your banking transactions, not so secure. So I like this one more sensing gift, or not gift, Huh, showing my age. Um, this Homer Simpson image, which I've modified to, to quantum, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems, right? It, it used to be a beverage, which I'll let you figure out. Um, so so uh, this is the cause of life's encryption problems right now, but what, what, what could be a solution? Well, these entangled quantum states mean that if you can distribute entangled particles to different parts of the planet, say between two people who want to communicate, and you can actually generate a perfectly secure key, right? So you can create encryption keys where you know whether or not that distribution of that key has been compromised. And so then you have a method to generate perfectly secure um, encryption keys where you know if it's been compromised and it can enable you to now do transactions with each other. All right, so that's communication, that's computing. What about probing the world around us? Sensing things is more important than ever, right? The, the prevalence of, um, you know, of um, cheap and, and easily deployable sensing technologies makes a lot of things very interesting and very easy. You can go ahead and get an Arduino. It's filled with a bunch of sensing, uh, little sensing elements that, that you can easily combine in circuits to automatically water your plants or monitor you know the temperature in your home things like that being able to detect the world is very important it's in, and so it's important in the mundane but it's also important in the fundamental so there are very interesting um things that you can probe when you start to build sensing devices based on very very uh uh, uh, uh sensitive and interesting quantum mechanical effects 
So one of these discoveries was the discovery of gravitational waves. So this is quite cool. If you don't know what those are, we exist in um, something called space time. And space time is kind of like a fabric. So imagine a bunch of pool balls on a rubber sheet, right? So when a pool ball is bounced on that rubber sheet, it creates little waves that vibrate out, right? The pool ball would be planets, let's say, right? So those vibrations, what they do is they actually stretch and compress the fabric of reality. And what's really interesting is that, let's say you have a situation where you have two black holes, right? The, the, and they're orbiting around each other, then they're maximally stretching and compressing space-time so that you can actually have reality be compressed and stretched over very large length scales, although the effects are very, very tiny. So we've actually been able to detect this now. So we know, and this is a further verification of Einstein's theory of general relativity, but it's also amazing that we can detect the compressing and stretching of space-time itself from objects that are, are millions of light years away. I actually don't know how far they are away. How far are they? Do you know? Billion. <laughs> All right, so I'm in good company. All right, so, so um, that was enabled by using uh, uh, states, special states of light called squeeze states. Right? But there are other things you can do. You can make quantum accelerometers and quantum clocks that are useful for military applications and position navigation and timing. And you can also take advantage of nanostructures and the ability to create quantum states to make extremely sensitive um, uh, 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 probes for biological systems. So this can actually let us, let us start to understand ourselves in fundamentally new ways as well, which is very exciting. And so the applications for computing as well end up being legion, finance, so, so JP Morgan will take more, oh, uh, finance companies will take more of your money, right? So just kidding, uh, but, but you can model the market better. Uh, aerospace, fluid dynamics are notoriously hard problems to solve, right? So you can maybe make planes that are much more fuel efficient, much less costly to build as well. And drug discovery and design, you can conceive of um, accelerating the time it takes to create new kinds of drugs, potentially in response to, I don't know, a pandemic, all right? So who else is investing in this? Pretty much most of us on the planet are putting heavy amounts of money into this. So this is a map of um, investments as of 2021 into quantum. And you see many players, right? The US, Canada, EU, countries within the EU that are put particularly large amounts in, China, India, Australia, Singapore, New Zealand, so on and so forth. Um, so the graph is nice, but it's it's pretty and it shows you the, the spatial distribution. But potentially what's more um, useful and, and maybe a little bit scary is, is a histogram display of this, where it shows the amount invested by country. And as you can see, you might think, oh, the U.S. must be at the top. We are certainly not, right? China is investing, and this is public sector investments, by the way. It doesn't account for what private sector putting it. So maybe that helps us out a little bit, but China's putting in 15.3 into quantum. The next closest is European, the European Union, that's 7.2. We're lagging way behind, we're at 1.9. So these technologies are really useful for both our economic security and our national security, yet we aren't putting in the money for it right now. So, oh, come on. So at Mason, we've tried to address the challenge of making sure that um, you know, the US can, can be a leader in quantum technology and quantum education, quantum research. And so in 2018, we founded the Quantum Science and Engineering Center here at the university. We have seven member departments spanning a wide range of disciplines. Uh, and we have excellent partners, many of whom are here today. Thank you, excellent partners. We appreciate you. Uh, I'm running out of time, otherwise I'd read all your logos. Uh, so, so, and what do we do? We try to take a transdisciplinary approach to quantum research and education. Quantum mechanical effects are fundamental to a variety of different disciplines. So disciplinary boundaries cease to be a useful construct. So we don't care about them. What we care is about pursuing the science and engineering goals that make these technologies a reality. And so we don't care what department you're from, we work together, right? And we also don't care about what department you're from when we're thinking about education. We find ways to make sure that mechanical engineers can take on the necessary skills to join the quantum industry, right? For instance, sorry, mechanical engineer to single you out for that. 
Uh -huh. So what do we do? We have active experimental and theoretical research in quantum computing and algorithms, quantum sensors, quantum materials. We're dedicated to building a world-class quantum workforce with equity at its core. There's a massive workforce shortage in this area. And so making sure that we build a workforce that has representation of everyone in the US at its core is crucial, not only for ethical reasons, but also for actually making sure that the US can compete in this really important future area. Without that, we can't, right? And working with our private partners in industry and our government partners, you know, this is something where it's, it's fascinating, interesting and lucrative and, and useful. Um, we need to make sure that as we're designing our, our new education programs and working on our research, we're doing so in a way where we're informed by what the needs are, actual technological needs, actual workforce needs. So that is, that is what QSEC does. And QSEC as a whole it, <clears throat> has grown um, quite a bit over the five years. And this graph is showing the dark green bar is what you should pay attention to. That's our research expenditures from external awards. And as you can see, it's been rising rapidly. And what that means for you students practically is more GRA opportunities, more postdoc positions, more undergraduate research positions. So this is something we've been putting a lot of effort and energy into and trying to expand here. Um, so I'm gonna skip over our organizational structure since I've already hit time, but we are humans and we exist. Many of us are from many departments. Our center breaks down by materials, computing, and sensing. At the core of all of it is education and training of the next generation of quantum scientists and engineers. Many wonderful individuals here um, run our, our different groups of materials, sensing, computing, and education. I don't have time to, to list them all, but they are all uh, well described on our website. And again, many people. Uh, take part in our efforts. Many faculty from all over this university join into these efforts to make sure that Mason can lead this, this march into the, the second quantum revolution, all right? Um, our materials group, what do we do in there? We try to grow material. We've talked only about atoms, right? And we've talked about electrons so far today. That's not so easy to just hand me an electron and be like, here's your quantum device, right? So it's better if we can think about creating materials that host quantum mechanical properties and build technologies based upon those. That's what our quantum materials group does. We synthesize new and interesting quantum materials, materials that support um, emergent quantum mechanical states, hopefully at elevated temperatures, right? And then we put those in devices and then we study them theoretically and we benchmark those devices. And this is useful for qubits, for quantum light sources, for quantum interconnection, energy efficient devices that even aren't necessarily quantum, but still might improve conventional computing. Our research in quantum sensing is, is um, world shattered. Um, so we actually hold the world record for the world's most sensitive quantum magnetometer and quantum gradiometer. Um, that's held by Dr. Karen Sauer in the physics department. Not many people know that, right? But we also have amazing work going on in nanobiosensing, a lot of which is held up by, is run by Toby Kang back there in the back from the mechanical engineering department. And, um, you know, we really focus on, you know, collaborating across disciplines here to be able to detect something you need to understand what the biological nature of that something is in order to intelligently design a material and a device to probe. Right. Now there's a mouse. All right. So in quantum computing, um, I myself am a material scientist, so I am, I am the least qualified to talk about this, but the entirety of tomorrow is devoted to computing and education. So please come on by and check more about it there. But what we work on primarily in quantum computing is coming up with new kinds of algorithms. Computers, quantum computers do things in a fundamentally new way, right? So it's not like you can just run C++ on a quantum computer. You can't just deploy, um, you can't just take your problem and easily translate it necessarily into a manner that a quantum computer can solve. This is a new area, it's a new research area for us. So creating the algorithms that can actually solve these problems on a quantum system is a big challenge. Our educational efforts are, are one of our major shining stars of our center. Um, we've secured funding from the Department of Education to support a quantum internship program, which is a paid high school internship program. This is important for representation. We don't want a family to have to choose between one of their kids getting to explore a summer internship that could launch their college career or helping their family get by in these really hard financial times. 
So we pay our students, our high school students, 15 bucks an hour to take part in quantum research over the summer. Right? We also pay professional development for teachers because this is how you scale. Right? Those teachers take their new quantum knowledge, they bring it back to their classrooms. And this is K to 12. And these teachers are the ones who know how to bring interesting material into their students' minds, no matter what age they are. So this is how you scale, where you have these teachers impacting hundreds of students and inspiring them to think about these pathways. So this is how you, 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 you build a workforce and how you build a more educated and, and scientifically literate society as well. We've also had innovations in graduate programs. We have one of the world uh, nation's first quantum information science and engineering master's programs. Uh, and an internship program is a mandatory and critical part of that master's program. And finally, uh, we have um, you know, additional, uh, um, many of our proposals to the NSF and other organizations have workforce efforts built into them at their core. Okay, we work with our friends in the region. Here we are at Mason. Here's our other friends, Miter, Booz Allen Hamilton, NIST. We write papers with them. We make figures with them. Uh, we take pictures with them and things like that's the Quantum World Congress. You know, the world, one of the first, uh, what's the right terminology? First, first international quantum event. Yes. World. Perfect. Cross sector, there it is. I was looking for the buzzword. One of the world's first cross sector quantum events um, that brought together academia, industry, and government from 11 countries at least, um, because I don't know how to count. Uh, all right, so, so this DC area is also one which is a hotbed for this kind of research that, that you could be doing and, and the kind of education you can get in this area. It's a great place to be right now. All right, so what's next for you today? Um, well, first of all, you're gonna be behind schedule because that's a perk of the job. Um, but uh, um, what's happening next? So you're done hearing me talk. So next we're gonna hear from George Thomas. He's the chief innovation officer of the Potomac Quantum Innovation Center. They were responsible for running that Quantum World Congress. And George is responsible for more or less single-handedly lifting up quantum in this region as, as a priority area and making, trying to make DC the capital of quantum. So I'm, you know, there you go. I'm, I'm a hype, is, that, is the, the term you kids use hype man? Is that correct? Is that correct? All right, very good. Well, I'll follow up with a talk by, um, and, and my uh, pronunciation won't be great, but Dr. Yong Jin Yoon, um, who's the lead system scientist at N5 Sensors, and he's going to tell you how they're trying to use quantum to make better sensors to probe the world around them. Um, after that, we'll eat food, because that's what you do. Uh, and then we'll follow it up with two live streams, one of which is from my colleague and, and collaborator and good friend, Dr. Shauna Holland at the University of New Hampshire, where she's going to show you how you can actually directly visualize an atom and quantum states associated with an atom. And then we're going to hear a talk from Dr. Kevin Yeager about making sandwiches. Well, we already had lunch. Well, these sandwiches are made from materials that are just a few atoms thick. So he's going to show us what Brookhaven is doing to make those yummy sandwiches. Don't actually eat them. Sometimes what's in that might not be good for you. All right. Then we're going to hear from MITRE. Dr. Joe Hagman is going to talk to us a bit about MITRE, what it does, and why they care about quantum and where they're doing their work. Then we're going to drink coffee because, again, that's what you do. And then we'll hear about today uh, about the ideal quantum sensors from Dr. Karen Sauer, who is um, the holder of the world record for the most sensitive quantum magnetometer. We'll finish up with the discussion of one of my prior students, J.D. Joshi, um, who is going to talk about his career in uh, cryptography, where he had a quantum materials background and leveraged that to go into a company that uses quantum to make random numbers. And then you can talk to and interact with our students who are going to show posters on the kind of work they do here at the University of Quantum. So that'll be today. Tomorrow, there are some more things, all about quantum computing, quantum education. And then at the end of it, we are going to do some gaming because I hear the kids love the games, right? So there'll be some game time to be able to play some games that will require you to think in a quantum way and potentially have the chance to create your own games based upon understanding of quantum. So that's that's what's coming. So with that, um, what's next for you? Hang out, eat food, drink coffee, 
listen, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Be brave, right? And, and make connections. Uh, and if you want to get more involved and join research teams and learn more about quantum, reach out to any of the faculty here or any of the speakers here and we can help you make that change or make that transition. So, and these are examples of some of our students who've been funded in the past and, and supported by the center. And we hope that you can be one of them in the future. So with that, we thank you and all these other places. So, and I uh, have time, I don't have time for any questions, but I'll take one anyway. Anthony um, on the Zoom asked, what kind of work do math majors do in the fields of quantum science and technology? That is a great answer. Right now, most of the work that the mathematicians do in this space is in the area of quantum algorithms and quantum optimization. So a lot of math majors do optimization work, right? Figuring out how to make that work on a quantum machine is a different problem altogether. But I myself am not a mathematician, so I can only give you a limited answer to that question. If you come tomorrow morning, Dr. Michael Jarrett, who is a professor in the mathematics department, will be talking about what he does in that space. So that means you gotta come tomorrow. Thanks, Anthony. Are there any other questions? Okay, so let's play me off then, thank you. Um, and let's get ready for our next um, speaker, George Thomas.